Hello and welcome to the Bible Feed podcast. My name is Lawrence and I have Paul here with me today and we're going to look at another one of the book introductions and today we're going to look at the book of Proverbs which you will find in your Old Testament or Hebrew scriptures. So Paul, what are we going to be looking at today? Hi Lawrence. Yeah, Proverbs. It's a book that I've always found hard to read so I thought it's a great one to do an introduction on and see what we can find out about it maybe make it easier for me to read as well as anyone who who wants to listen to this because it isn't really the kind of book like some of the other books in the old testament that are telling a story you know it's not like genesis with the story of abraham and joseph it's not like the story of the the king whoever whatnot (laughs) insert insert name (laughs) Um, yeah it's not like that it's often referred to as wisdom literature yeah, And there's a little collection of books in the middle of our Bibles that are often called wisdom literature. And Proverbs sits alongside Ecclesiastes and Job. I think it's quite helpful to see Proverbs as part of that little collection with Ecclesiastes and Job. When you read Proverbs, you often kind of get this sense that there's this idealistic link between, you know, you do the right thing and you'll be blessed and your life will be great. You do the stupid thing or the foolish thing, as Proverbs puts it, and all sorts of bad things will happen to you and your life outcomes will be pretty poor. And it seems like really straightforward and simple and that's all you need to do. And but So if you had Proverbs on its own, that's kind of the conclusion you get to. But we've got Ecclesiastes and Job next to it. And in Ecclesiastes, there's someone who's really rich, has everything that they could possibly want. And his conclusion is, I need to fear the Lord. And then you have Job, which is the opposite. You have a man who everything is taken away from him. And his conclusion is, I need to fear the Lord. And it kind of says, okay, that theoretical wisdom is all very well. But in the real world, this is what it looks like in Ecclesiastes and Job. And it just helps you think about, meditate about what that all means in the real world. Yeah, it's interesting how these books are put uh, in... uh connection with each other in order to maybe explain and fit, fill in some of the color and like you said i've had this before where we go through proverbs and because we can't really find any structural themes the mm. question that we ask each other is oh what's your favorite proverb from that from that <laughs> chapter so it'd be great to maybe sort of try and find some of those themes because there are some but they seem to be cycling around lots of repeated phrases that we find in there so and i think one major one that you cannot ignore as you're reading Proverbs is probably found in the very first chapter. I'll just read a verse, verse 7 of Proverbs 1, where it says, Fear the Lord, fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So there's this kind of coupled theme of fearing the Lord and wisdom, the beginning of wisdom. Yeah. And that as I say, sits alongside Job in Ecclesiastes. And you find that same phrase appearing in both of those books as well. In Job chapter 28, middle of the book of Job, it says, and he said to man, behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And then it appears right at the end of Ecclesiastes, you know, the whole duty of man first there, right at the end of Ecclesiastes. So we've got that theme, that principle, if you like, linking those three wisdom books. So let's get straight into some extracts from the book of Proverbs. Oh, let's. I'm going to read two little sections for you, Lawrence. Right here. And I want you to tell me, what's the difference between these two sections? It's like my GCSE English exam all over again. I'm going to take something from Proverbs chapter 4, this beginning of of Proverbs chapter 4. It says this, Hear, O sons, a father's instruction, and be attentive that you may gain insight For I give you good precepts, do not forsake my teaching. When I was a son with my father, tender, the only one in the sight of my mother, he taught me and said to me, let your heart hold fast my words, keep my commandments and live. So there's a little section from Proverbs chapter 4. Now I'm going to read some verses from Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 10. Okay, you ready? Yeah, take it away. And what's the difference from that first section? So... Proverbs 13, verse 10. By insolence comes nothing but strife, but with those who take advice is wisdom. Wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Whoever despises the word brings destruction upon himself, but he who reveres the commandment 
will be rewarded. That's probably enough. Okay. So I, two little sections there, about four verses each. Yeah. So That's the difference between them. Well, I mean, that first one, it was. There's a lot more storytelling element to it, isn't there? Kind of a uh, bit more of a. It's almost like you would tell a parable today. You know, if you were sort of yeah. talking about a proverb or a parable, you'd say, you know, a man went down to the shop and he did, and he build a. You build a <laughs> sort of a. A yeah. story around yeah. it, and, and then it has a meaning. It's, so more of a narrative. And it's someone saying, "Yeah, you know, I listen to me because my father told me these things, and yeah. and and you should listen." Passing well. on wisdom. Yeah. It's almost like the the, the round the fire wisdom passing mm. on. And then that second one is like the quick fire round, isn't it? It's the it's the <laughs> you've just got like very short, sharp parallelisms that you see within those within those verses. You know, don't be like this, be like this. Don't do that, do this. And yeah, says, and they're independent, aren't they? Yeah. They're not, each verse isn't really connected to the previous one or the next one. Whereas in the first section, it flows. Mm. The verses are joined together mm. and it's a it's a poem, but it's flowing through multiple verses. Yeah. I suppose we don't have verses in the original, so you would have you would have had them in sort of okay, stanzas, I point. suppose, wouldn't you? Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so th- does this then uh, sort of highlight for us some kind of delineation between sections of, of Proverbs? Is this a way that we can uh, group that group Proverbs together? Yeah, so I think what the two little passages that I read are taken from the first collection in this book of Proverbs and the second collection. And generally, there's thought to be seven sections of, of Proverbs in the book of Proverbs that we've got today in our Bible. So I think it would be a good idea to step through those and and see what they are and try and try and identify them. We Just should. helps us to to read it as well, I think. So our first section, beginning at the beginning, we've got a little bit of an introduction, as you might expect, you know, the Proverbs of Solomon, there to know wisdom, instru- instruction and so on. And the first section I think goes through to the end of chapter nine. So the first nine chapters okay. of Proverbs. And essentially, it's 12 poems. And again, I'm just going to read some examples of the beginnings of some of these poems. So here's one in chapter 2, verse 1. My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, dot, dot, dot. Let's take another one. Chapter 3, verse 11. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. Let's take another one. Chapter 4, verse 1. Hear, O sons, a father's instruction, and be attentive that you may gain insight. Now, one more. Chapter 6. And the theme, the connection is probably becoming quite obvious now. Chapter 6, verse 1. My son, if you have put up security for your neighbour and have given pledge for a stranger, dot, dot, dot. There we go. Yeah. To carry on your quiz that you're you're obviously giving me here, (laughs) it seems pretty obvious that this is wisdom from a father to a son passing on on the proverbs yeah. that a father has learnt during life and uh, passing it on to a son it's that kind of uh, feel to it doesn't it well when yeah, I say they, feel, they, they all start yeah. yeah my son hear my son hear my sons uh, one of them was plural yeah so al- although different scholars have different ideas about how to divide up this section to me this seemed the most obvious and, and there are 12 poems that begin my son in this section, mm-hmm. uh, the first nine chapters. There's a couple of others which aren't addressed to my son. So one example of that is in chapter 1, verse 20. It's just a poem about wisdom. So chapter 1, verse 20, wisdom cries aloud in the street, in the market, she raises her voice. And we're introduced to this, uh, a woman that is a, a sort of a personification of wisdom, which mm-hmm. is a really important concept pops up in other parts of of the bible as well but there's a poem there it's not it doesn't start here my son or something like that it's it's a poem more abstractly about wisdom and you get a couple of those don't you towards the end of that section as well yeah so So there you've got these 12 poems to my son a couple of other poems just about wisdom and that seems like a good way to introduce this collection of proverbs it's a good introduction to the whole because it's to a son so it's to a young man Here's this advice, and this young man has got his whole life ahead of him. He's got all his choices ahead of him, and and this is kind of starting up and and introducing the whole. And what we need to do as we read this section, really, is just try and identify the group of verses that forms a complete 
poem, if you like, and then kind of read it and consider it together. Okay, yeah, and I suppose we are given an indication that it is father to a son from right at the the very beginning of Proverbs, don't we? Because yeah. we get that relationship between Solomon and David called out in the first verse. Proverbs of yeah. Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. Yeah, and, and some people think this first section is David to Solomon rather than Solomon to his sons, yeah. but I'm, I'm not sure we can be definitive either way there. So that takes us to the end of that first section. So we've gone to chapter nine and we've ended up with those couple of examples of wisdom being personified. But what happens then? Yeah, so then we go into the second section. So chapter 10 onwards, I mean, right through to chapter 22. And I'm going to say through to chapter 22, verse 16. Mm. Okay, so a really big chunk of, of Proverbs. And that is full of these single verse statements you know they're, they're they're often couplets there's like two sentences or two halves to the to the saying as we as we just commented earlier so we've got a second section is this really big section um right from chapter 10 through to the middle of chapter 22 do we see any kind of themes or or flow to this middle section that we can we can identify um no <laughs> Wrong I, it, it's really i mean <laughs> it's it's really it is really difficult to group them by theme or structure them in in any way i mean you'll see some proverbs and they're sort of about the same kind of subject you know maybe it's about how you speak whether you speak truth or lies or whether it's about money or whether it's about working hard and getting up early in the morning and doing stuff and getting on with stuff and people have tried to put a structure and themes and it, but it all seems very subjective to me and so i think rather than invent a structure that might actually not be there it's probably just best to see this as a as a long collection of these single verse statements and each of them can stand on its own and and we'll come back at, at the end to, and think about when we've been through the structure how do you read those little single verse couplets okay we'll come back to that then uh, m- most unsatisfactory answer there paul but thank you very much <laughs> so we don't have potentially like a a structural theme in that section but let's come back to how we read them in a moment so that takes us into chapter 22 and you you're saying from verse 17 onwards so what happens at that point yeah so there's a break there and it seems as though the reason we can say there is a break there is because from chapter 22 verse 17 seems to sort of give a heading for a new section so in chapter 22 verse 17 it says, incline your ear and hear the words of the wise. And that the words of the wise or the sayings of the wise is a heading for this section. So incline your ear and hear the words of the wise. Apply your heart to my knowledge, for it will be pleasant if you keep them within you. If all of them are ready on your lips, that you tr- that your trust may be in the Lord. I have made them known to you today, even to you. Have I not written for you 30 sayings of counsel? and knowledge and so it seems to be introducing now with a heading the words of the wise or the sayings of the wise and what's going to follow is 30 sayings yeah okay Um, you convinced me there that's fine so there's a (laughs) kind of intro section there so i've got another question for you lawrence go on then so what did you notice about those few verses i just read as distinct from this big section in the middle which is single verse Couplets. Oh, we're back to the old, the narrative structure, multiverse structure. We Not are. multiverse as in a multiverse, <laughs> but multiple multiverse, verses. No. no, there's no evidence whatsoever for a multiverse. No. But there is lots of evidence here in Proverbs for multiple multiverse verses. poems. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. So we're back to that format. And there's also quite a lot of Hear My Sons in this section as well. So back in familiar territory there with, with multiverse sayings. Okay. So, but in this section, so I've heard that this collection has been copied from Egyptian sources. And this particular 
source, which is instructions to AmenNOP. I'm not sure whether I'm pronouncing that correctly or not, but there was like 30 sayings which have come from that material. So, you know, is this inspired material or is this just copied from a human source? Now, let's try and establish what's going on here. Okay, that's a, a comment that's often made about this little section. It's very similar to this this other document, the instruction of a menemope. And so is it just copied from that and, and it's not original material? I think it's really interesting to think about that because it, I think it tells us a lot about what it means for Scripture to be inspired, how God is communicating to us in the inspired word and therefore authoritative as instruction from God. But that doesn't mean that there can't be interdependency and linkages and kind of nods to other documents that were in existence at the time these proverbs were were collected. And it's useful just to think about the similarities and the differences between this little section of proverbs and the instruction of amenemope. I'm going to say it very carefully. Yeah. I'm <laughs> so, not saying it again. Yeah. I mean, let's just take some examples. So so that opening section that, that I read included these words, incline thine ear and hear the words of the wise, apply thine heart to my doctrine. This is from the King James Version. It is pleasant if thou keep them in thy belly that they may be established together upon thy lips. So that's that's how it opens. This instruction of this Pharaoh goes like this. Give thine ear and hear what I say. Apply thine heart to apprehend. It is good for thee to place them in thine heart. Let them rest in the casket of thy belly that they may act as a peg upon thy tongue. So it's it's really similar. And and then the next little section starts from Proverbs 22, verse 22. Rob not the poor, for he is poor. Neither oppress or crush the lowly in the gate. And Amenemope says, beware of robbing the poor and oppressing the afflicted in, in the next section there. And there's quite a lot of, of similarities as you go through the 30 sayings. But there are also big differences as well. This instruction of Amenemope I'm getting good at it now. Yeah, you're doing really good. <laughs> um, the instruction of Amenemope is is much longer than this little section of 30 sayings. So it has the kind of the core saying, and then it goes on and expands and starts to talk about what you should do with in worshipping this god or that god of, of Egypt and how you should take things to the authorities and maintain the hierarchy of, of those that are important in Egypt and and those that were not important and not cross those those barriers and maintain the hierarchy in the social structure of Egypt. Whereas in these proverbs, there's none of that kind of thing. It's all pointed at God himself and at the relationship between human beings and, and God. So there was that one we took, do not rob the poor because he is poor or crush the afflicted at the gate. And there's a similar thing in Amenemope. For... Proverbs continues, it says, for the Lord will plead their cause, the cause of the poor, and rob of life those who rob them. So it's immediately taken that phrase, but pointed it in a different direction then and started to say, think about this in terms of your relationship to the one true God, because that one true God is the God of that poor man as well that you're afflicting. And so, yes, there are similarities. What seems to be happening here is that by inspiration, a familiar genre, a familiar format of communicating is being used, but then it's being pointed at God and at the relationship between humans uh, and God. Okay, I see. So those instructions of Amen Odenem, <clears throat> I'll do that again. So also in the instructions of Amen Ope, they are considerably earlier, aren't they, than the Proverbs, so 12th century. So before Solomon. So these sayings and proverbs are building on them. So it seems like this instruction of Amenemope is, is a really early document, 12th century BC. So it would be conceivable for Solomon to have been aware of that document. And when these proverbs are collected through inspiration, for that to be part of the consciousness of what's being communicated now and we know solomon married the daughter of pharaoh so there was a connection with egypt at the time of solomon so it's quite possible that this is a, a document that people were aware of and now here as part of solomon's inspired proverbs he's taking that document and effectively you know subverting it and pointing it in another direction
Okay, so the 30 sayings, thank you, I've identified that. Now what happens after the 30 sayings? After the 30 sayings, we get a small section that is a few more sayings. So the 30 sayings go through to chapter 24 and verse 23, or verse 22, and then verse 23 says, these also are sayings of the wise. And there's a few more just to the end of the chapter, I think. So there's further words of the wise or sayings of the wise. And I think that serves again to just set it apart from the Egyptian instructions and say, actually, there's more wisdom from God. There's further sayings. So that that takes us to the end of chapter 24. And then we're into another section. And we're into chapter 25, verse 1. It's clearly a a new section because it starts like this. These also are the Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied. So we've got now a collection of Proverbs that were, were brought together at the time of King Hezekiah. So that's about 300 years after Solomon or something like that. And and they go through to the end of chapter 29. So explicitly, we've got here a later collection of proverbs from a later period in the history of Israel. So this book has obviously built up over time. It's not something that's just pinged into existence as, as one event. It's been added to over the period of the kings, and particularly here at the time of Hezekiah, when the Assyrians were invading, Sennacherib was, was doing his stuff and impaling people and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And this section is is back to that format of single verse couplets and things like that. Okay. So, and I, that is one of the most fascinating things I find about this book is the fact that it has built up oh, like layer upon layer to mm. the book we have today would not have been the book that Solomon would have seen and it wouldn't have been the book that Hezekiah would have seen because Hezekiah was mm. adding things or his yeah. writers were adding things to it. I think that's a you know, fascinating aspect of uh, inspiration. Okay, uh, any more you want to say about this section here or should we move on to what's next? I think we're ready to move on. So we're getting cu- close to the end now. So we've done five of those. You said there were seven. So talk about the last two. Yeah, so the last two are the last two chapters, chapter 30 and chapter 31. So chapter 30 is introduced this way. It's the words of Agur, son of Jacob. I don't think we really have much idea who he was or where he came from. And so we have his words in chapter 30. And he says, the man declares... I am weary, O God. I am weary, O God, and worn out. Surely I am too stupid to be a man. I have not the understanding of a man. And then in verse 7, he says, Two things I ask of you. Deny them not to me before I die. So, question for you, Lawrence. Oh, not another What sort of life stage is Agar in in this little section? I think we're coming to the twilight years here, aren't we? (laughs) We're coming towards the end. Life is... It's full of weariness and and hardship. Yeah, he's considering the prospect of his his mortality, the end of life, and reflecting back, actually, in many ways, on his failure to heed wisdom. He sees that both looking back at his own life and in society around him and so on. So that's quite sad mm. that we started off with this young man. Here, my son you know make good choices and then we have Ager here at the end do you know what I don't think I really did make good choices but we're not quite at the end yet because we've got chapter 31 and two sections to this final um, chapter the words of King Lemuel again it's not entirely clear who who that is so we won't speculate And then there's the really famous passage, the last section of the book of Proverbs about the virtuous woman and all the wonderful things she does. And there's this sort of extended description of this woman of wisdom, which, if you remember, we saw wisdom personified as a woman uh, right back in that opening section. So here, the whole thing wraps up like the the bookends of the of the book of proverbs and it finishes up with this extended description of the wise woman but this time she's a wife so in this this context the young man has married the wise woman and has a has a committed relationship with her has has married wisdom it seems and that's how that's how the book ends so that's much more positive Mm. than Ager's reflection on perhaps not quite making all the right choices yeah and 
as a, as themes go, wisdom being at the end and being at the beginning is what we see in, in Proverbs. So Proverbs 31 verse 10, it says, An excellent wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. And that's an echo all the way back to the beginning of Proverbs. So where we started looking at this advice to my son and those sections that we saw about the personification of wisdom in chapter 3 verse 15 it uses a very similar phrase it says about wisdom she is more precious than jewels and nothing you desire can compare with her so there you've got basically a thread that goes from mm. from the beginning of proverbs to this almost an encapsulation of all things wise in this wife in this figure at the yeah. end yeah excellent okay so we've covered all the sections those seven sections thank you for that but we said we would go and have a little bit more of a detailed look at that middle section the one with the couplets yeah. and, and parallelism in so let's do that let's go back to i think it was around chapters 22 ish where we've got these parallelisms yeah so it's it's the big section from i think chapter 10 yeah. through to chapter 22 yeah, so let's think about these these couplets and these parallel statements. There's some quite useful ways of, of just breaking that down a bit and thinking about different types of parallelisms that are used. This is, this is a particular feature of Hebrew poetry, which isn't really the same as you know, English poetry. We don't really find them in, in Shakespeare. We know that because we tried and we looked we and we couldn't it. find any. <laughs> <laughs> we read the complete works of Shakespeare. <laughs> And we couldn't find it. So it's a th particular feature of, of Hebrew poetry. And, you know, it makes these really short statements, kind of parallel ideas as a way of expressing some truth. So I'm going to give four types of, of parallelisms, okay? So, and, and Lawrence, you need to come up with a way of remembering okay. how these four parallelisms work. So here we go. Concentrate now. Okay. So parallelism number one is a synonymous parallelism okay okay and what that means is you've got two statements in the verse and they're basically repeating the same idea so the second part of the verse is repeating the first so that's a synonymous parallelism okay number two is an antithetic parallelism oh it's my favorite okay and that is where the second line is saying the opposite of the first line it's a contrast Got that? Love a contrast. Thank you. Antithetic. Yeah. yeah. Third type of parallelism is an emblematic parallelism. So this is where the first part is sort of figurative. And then the second part says, and this is what it represents literally. Mm -hmm. So it'll be something like, dum de dum de dum is like dum de dum de dum. Yeah. It's very like it in that case. So that's the, yeah. <laughs> So that's an emblematic parallelism. Yeah, so we've yeah. done three. Yeah. Four, we've got one more to go. And the fourth one is called a synthetic parallelism. So this is, it's a little bit like the first one, synonymous. So the two halves of the verse are sort of saying the same thing, but the second half builds on the first. It sort of expands on it. It adds some information. It doesn't just repeat the same thing. It adds some extra information or colour. Okay. So there we go. Four synonymous parallelism. Antithetic, emblematic, synthetic. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So we're going to try and devise a way of remembering. Yeah, well those. we did we we had a food based one earlier, didn't we? Oh, okay. It was, it was <laughs> yeah. sausages and yeah. eggs sizzle was what we came up with. Okay. But yeah, well, uh, sausage and eggs yeah. sizzle. Okay, anyway. we'll, we'll stick with that. Well, so. well. Right. Having gone through all of those unnecessary naming convention for the different <laughs> parallelisms, can you provide any examples to bring it to life? Yeah, I think that's what we have to do. So yeah. I'm going to give you some examples, Lawrence. Okay. And I'm going to ask you to tell me which kind of parallelism it is. So here we go. Is it synonymous, antithetic, emblematic, or synthetic? Sounds like that song from. You know, oh, a thoroughly modern major general. Yeah. 
Yes. <laughs> Synonymous yeah, synthetic cream, emblematic yeah. synthetic, etc. Okay, go on then. Yeah. Fire away. Good. Okay, so here's our first example. Which of it is? So here, here we go. The thoughts of the righteous are just, but the counsels of the wicked are deceitful. So they're against each other. So anti, antithetic. Okay. Would you agree? We're going for antithetic. Yeah. I, I would agree with that. Yeah, Excellent. Yeah. So what is that? So they're put in contrast to each other. So when you think about, when you recognize that, you kind of think, okay, thoughts of the righteous are just. But if you've got that on its own, you don't really know what, what does just mean? What's the counter of that? Yeah. Almost? So, but then you've got the opposite. The counters of the wicked are deceitful. Mm-hmm. So now you can say, okay, well, what just means is not deceitful. Yeah. So you can see how it emphasizes the contrast and, yeah. adds Brings something. it to life. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. Next. You ready for another one? Next. Here we go. Here's the next one. As a ring of gold in a swine's snout, so is a beautiful woman who lacks discretion. Right. So is that like the like one? So that's the... Who is... The swine is like the woman who lacks discretion. Yeah. So that's the emblematic one. Oh, you've got it. Got it in one. Get it in. Yeah. I, I guess to be to be correct, we should say... It, it could also apply to a handsome man. It could. So, I mean, it's a great, it's a great proverb, isn't it? As a ring of gold in a swine snout. So I, th- I think what you get from this is that the ring of gold is tiny in a swine snout. The swine is, is a huge lumbering beast and it's got this little ring of gold. And that's the thing of beauty. But in the, when you see a beautiful woman or you see a handsome man, you know, that's the main thing that you see. You don't see the lack of discretion until it kind of plays out in their character. But really, when it does play out, it's... It's everything. It's, as, it's, it's much more significant, like the swine and its tiny little ring. Yeah. Mm, that is a very good point, See actually. That? I'd not, I'd not yeah. seen that, yeah. the size comparison there. Very good. Yeah. Right, next, <laughs> next question, please. Right, next. Next question. Next. Okay, here we go. An evildoer listens to wicked lips. A liar pays attention to a destructive tongue. An evil doer listens to wicked lips. So is this one where an evil doer listens to wicked lips? A liar pays attention to a destructive tongue. So I think this is, I think this is the first one, isn't it? So it's, yeah, it sharpens, doesn't it? This is the one that sharpens. Yeah. So synonymous. So the first okay. one is synonymous with the second. Is that right? So that's the, it is. Yeah. It's basically saying the same thing, isn't it? Yeah. An evildoer listens to wicked lips. A liar pays attention to a destructive tongue. So yeah. it's, yeah, it's yeah. more or less just repeating the same thing, but with slightly different words. Okay, one more. One more. So and then by, we're done. Yeah, by process of elimination, I should get this one right. You should. I mean, you've got three out of three so yeah, far, and, and you're, you're on for a full, a full, full score. House. So here we go, the last one. The Lord has made everything for its own purpose, even the wicked for the day of evil. Yeah, so this is this synthetic one, which is like the second line, it kind of double clicks on the first line and adds additional detail, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. So if you think of that, those two statements, the Lord has made everything for its own purpose. If you just add that on its own, you might think, well, God made everything that was very good. And that's it. Everything should be very good. But then it adds this extra little nuance, even the wicked for the day of evil. So even the presence of evil is something that the Lord has made for its own purpose. And and it kind of expands and, and adds a lot more colour to that original statement by expanding on it. Very good. There we go. Very good. Parallelisms, Parallelisms in action. In action, yeah. And And listeners, please go ahead, pick a few and try and identify them. And you can be as humiliated as I've been during this entire podcast with Paul asking me (laughs) questions all the time. Okay. So I did say, I think at the beginning that we might make it easier to read the Proverbs. I think actually we've just made it harder. Well, maybe. Yeah. I mean, you just read one verse. Basically, (laughs) You just read one verse and you have to spend a whole load of time thinking about what kind of verse it is and then what that means. What does it mean? But Mm. I, I, I tell you what, those... That little exercise did make me think a little bit more about those proverbs and kind of why is it that like that ring one, the ring and the woman and or the handsome man, that was that's very interesting. Yeah, I suppose they call it meditation literature Medita- for a reason. Yeah, very good. 
I'm going to tell you to uh, please stop expounding the <laughs> proverbs now, Paul. We've all got too much work to okay. do now. I've, I've got and, nothing more to say. Okay. So I'm going to summarise briefly what we've spoken about. So Proverbs, wisdom literature. You can find it near Psalms, near Job, near Ecclesiastes in your Bibles. You can find that there's, there seems to be seven, a structure of seven within this book of different types of literature that have been added at various times during the history of Israel all of which is kind of leading us to understand how we can exhibit wisdom and the traits of wisdom uh, that we find in this book. So thank you very much for your time, Paul, in uh, expounding this to us. We do have um, a couple of other episodes which link to this. If you've not had enough of the wisdom literature, um, you can go and listen to uh, two episodes that we've done on Psalms. um, And also we've done one on Ecclesiastes as well. So... Thanks again, Paul, and see you next time. You've been listening to the Bible Feed podcast. Thanks for joining us. We're always keen to hear what you think and hear your questions on subjects you'd like us to discuss. Get in touch with us on our Facebook page or send us a message from our webpage at biblefeed.org and be part of the journey.